Thank you very much for those kind words, uh, Peter. Um, obviously, the letter from the Bishop of Liverpool was one of the documents that wasn't revealed to the panel because that's the first I've heard of it. <laughs> thank you. I'll be very quick just to thank everyone associated with today um, for all of their patience and forbearance in putting this on. I've been away. I've just flown back from Boston via Liverpool and the anniversary uh, in Liverpool, which I'll come back to in, in, in a short while. Um, so it's, it's great to be back, and uh, I'll be going back for the rest of my sabbatical next week. And thank you all for, for, for coming. But I want to keep it short because I want to get on to the, the main issues. And I want to start by talking about the work that I'm involved with, which is a broader canvas than Hillsborough, and it's one that many of my colleagues here and in other universities, and those who I've worked with over the years are committed to. And it takes a very well-worn phrase, which was then uh, reinvigorated during uh, the revolution in Chile uh, and Ariel Dorfman's commentary, which is that it's part of our responsibility as social scientists, as academics right across the board, uh, to speak truth to power. That's where tr change will come. It will come by looking at powerful institutions, examining them, understanding them, and then reminding them of the true circumstances. And if I can be just theoretically found grounded for the first few minutes, I mean, one of the issues of this research and all other research that myself and many of my other colleagues have been involved with is about bearing witness. It's about being a, a, being a chronicler. It's about actually developing uh, our potential for bearing witness from hearing the testimonies of others. It's gathering that information, making sense of it, making it available, and challenging the official discourse. And I think that goes without saying in terms of my own commitment, but it's something that I think is a responsibility on all of us as academics. It's about, in that sense, historically, looking back at the kinds of events that we're talking about, such as Hillsborough, it's about recovering truth, understanding what truth is, uh, having a dynamic approach to truth, that there isn't just one version, there isn't just one interpretation of the truth. It's about challenging, when we come across it, the deceit of power, that there will always be vested interests, there will always be self-interest, there will all be, always be professional interests behind almost all of the work that goes on in controversial circumstances. I, I'd worked much more broadly before Hillsborough on deaths in custody, on deaths in a whole range of controversial circumstances, and since on Dunblane, on the Marchioness, a whole range of other areas where you could see both private and public interests being protected and deceit with a small d, deceit in the broadest conceptual terms. In that sense, it is also about representing the view from below. Those of you in the audience who are historians will know only too well that history was written by those in power because of the questions around literacy and recording and holding people's accounts. We've never lived in a more dynamic time than the present, when the view from below can be instantly available, not always in, 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 in all honesty, but there on social media. But for us who are researchers, it's part of our mission to understand and make sense of the view from below, to represent it, not to speak for, for those people, but to understand it and feed it in to the broader, uh, the broader context of the issues that we're dealing with, and so to Hillsborough. Eddie Spirit was a, a very good friend of mine, and I would say he is one of the, clearly one of the others of Hillsborough who's died since Hillsborough. Eddie died uh, premature onset of Alzheimer's. He was missing for three hours on the afternoon. He'd been presumed dead and left for dead. And he was brought round in the hospital and recovered only partially. Uh, but I had a, a good life from then on until Alzheimer's caught him in his late 50s. Eddie's story is dynamic because Eddie's son died in his arms. He turned him to him in the crush, and they both went down together. And the first thing that he was told after he'd really regained consciousness 24 hours later was the son he tried to save had died. The crush came, it was like a vice getting tighter and tighter. I turned Adam round to me, he was obviously in distress. 
There was a police officer about five or six feet away and I started begging him to open the gate. I was screaming, Adam had fainted, and my actual words were, my lovely son is dying and begging him to help me. And he didn't do anything. He just stood there and looked at me. I grabbed hold of Adam. He had a tracksuit on. I grabbed hold of his lapels and I tried to lift him. The fence is 10 feet thereabouts, the spikes coming in. I couldn't lift him. So then I started punching punching the fence in the hope I might punch it down. Right at the beginning, when I was begging the officer to open the gate, he could have opened it, and I know I could have got Adam out. And then comes speaking truth to power. I know, because I was there. That interview was four years after Hillsborough. Somebody asked me after the memorial on Monday, did I ever doubt? And I said, no, I'd heard too many stories. Too many stories such as these. But we had to understand the dynamic. Why did the police officer not open the gate? It wasn't down to just one person. What is that process about? Hillsborough in context, and I'm going to be very quick, I'll have to skip through these early slides, but I think we need to have some context. This was a football um, match held, FA Cup semi-final, neutral ground, Liverpool versus Nottingham Forest, neutral ground, Hillsborough, Sheffield Wednesdays, one of the pre premier grounds, one of the premier stadiums in British football. So it's managed and owned by Sheffield Wednesday Football Club. It's hired by the FA, the Football Association, for one of its premier events. It's licensed by, Liverpool, by Sheffield City Council and it's policed by the South Yorkshire Police. A strange relationship in policing, stewarding inside the ground, policing outside, but also to some extent inside the ground. A kind of ambiguous relationship built up over time between the police and the club. 15th of April, fans arrive. They arrive on a beautiful day, a beautiful spring day. The word corralled is not mine. That is the technical term that was used for bringing fans from the train station, for bringing fans from the coach park. Corralled and escorted to the ground. They arrive at an outer concourse and there's an immediate crush at the turnstiles. They're arriving about half an hour before the game starts. 23 turnstiles at one end of the stadium processing 24,256 fans. They're going into a Leppings Lane Terrace, which is standing, the North Stand and the West Stand, all fed in through this one small outer concourse, smaller than the room we are in now. The terrace itself, 10,000 fans across seven, through seven malfunctioning turnstiles. They're going into pens that have been built in 1985 for crowd control. The police realise they can't get people through. The crush is becoming intense at the turnstiles. They open an exit gate and the fans enter, and as the cameras show, they enter slowly, carefully. They come into a, a ground, a stadium they don't know. They're faced with a tunnel. Above it, it says standing. They go straight down the tunnel. They are not to know it leads to two central pens. And in those central pens, they're already packed. They're going down a one in six gradient tunnel, an illegal tunnel that breaches all the safety regulations. Once you're down that tunnel, there's no way back. Compression, like a vice getting tighter and tighter, says Eddie. A barrier towards the front of pen three collapses. People go down 19, 20 deep at that barrier, crushed against the front wall. People behind can't pull back because the compression is still building. The refusal to open the perimeter gates, one to each pen, no wider than my shoulders. I would have to go through sideways. Fans are pushed back, trying to climb over the fence. They drop from the, st from, from the stand behind as they try to climb up into the emergency response doesn't come. There's no immediate medical response. These are crucial minutes, as we shall see. This is kind of what it looks like. 
You can see the outer, the, the, the outer, uh, the outer area, the concourse area, coming off the Leppings Lane itself. You can see where the turnstiles are. There's the tunnel going down under the West Stand. And the two central pens are immediately behind the goal. I want you to just keep this picture in your mind, just above the word south, right there on the corner flag, inside the stadium, is the police control box, an absolute perfect view of the terrace. And this is what it really looked like from the other side. You can see the control box just below the, sta the, be be below the Finlux uh, um, banner across on the far side. And you can also see the compression in the central pens. Compare it to the peripheral pen, where people are standing in plenty of room, some sitting on the steps. Those pens, those central pens, are now twice their authorised capacity. They become three times their authorised capacity. No checks. And you can see on the actual perimeter tra track, this is about the point that Eddie is saying, my lovely son is dying. The match is still going on. Bruce Grobelar's in goal. It's only at six minutes past that the match has stopped. This is the crucial moment. This is the moment that the barrier collapses. And this is the immediate aftermath. There's Bruce Grobelar still there in his goal. Fans now getting over the fence, coming out through the small gates. And that's taken, that last photograph is taken from immediately below the box. And in that box, Chief Superintendent Duckenfield, he had authorised the opening of the gate. But immediately, his response was to say Liverpool fans had stormed through the exit gate, entered into the stadium, rushed the pens, and as a direct consequence, people had died. Occasionally, it's a word I'm always loath to use, occasionally you have to name something as it is. It was a lie. He knew. He knew the score. He'd authorised the opening of the gates. He had a barrage of monitors there in his control box. And he was in touch by radio to every single police officer on duty at that end of the ground. He said afterwards, I was not being deceitful. We were all in a state of shock. I just thought at that stage, I shouldn't communicate the situation. I may have misled Mr. Kelly. What is he referring to? An interview he gave to Kelly, who was, at that point, leading the Football Association. He'd come immediately to the box. What is going on? And he told him, Liverpool fans had broken into the stadium. Liverpool fans had caused the death of their own. Kelly repeated Duckenfield's lie to the waiting media, and within minutes, it was broadcast around the world. Liverpool fans were blamed within the first 30 minutes of people realising that there was an incident. And the impact of that, Jacques Georges, FIFA president, within two hours had said they were like beasts waiting to charge into the arena. The coroner who arrived at six o'clock that evening immediately ordered the taking of blood alcohol levels of all men, women and children, something unprecedented in any disaster. As you would all know, normally you would only take blood alcohol levels of a train driver or a, or a, um, a pilot. You would not take blood alcohol levels of the deceased. And a South Yorkshire police briefing at the time, I don't think it would be right now to be talking about the animalistic behaviour of fans, the level of drink. Whoever is looking at it overall will find it out without any problem. This is an immediate briefing within the South Yorkshire police. And that briefing contains these words, drunken, ticketless, abusive, violent hooligans. And Brian Clough, the manager of Nottingham Forest, who's there at the ground, says... Liverpool fans were killed by Liverpool people. A day later, the disaster really unfolding, Margaret Thatcher arrives at the stadium. She also visits the hospitals. This is interesting 
because there's no record of any of these meetings. There is absolutely no record of the chief constable who is there, of the, the chair, chairman of the football club who is there, of the head of the city council, of what they said at those moments. We have no knowledge of that, except from St. Bernard Ingham in a letter that he wrote. I visited Hillsborough on the morning after the disaster. I know what I learned on the spot. There would have been no Hillsborough if a mob who were clearly tanked up on drink had, sorry, clearly, clearly tranked up, had not tried to force their way into the ground. To the blame, the police is a cop-out. I see no purpose in addressing the, an organisation which is incapable of accepting this simple fact. He's talking about the Liverpool City Council. So this is what was found. This is the corridor or the terrorist conversation that was being held. And so it followed. A judicial inquiry led by Lord Justice Taylor was appointed that week. Criminal and disciplinary investigations lasting two to three years. Inquests, the longest at that time inquest in English legal history, split between individual hearings for 96 and then resumed as a generic hearing a year later. Civil actions taken in five or six different cases. Eventually a judicial review of the inquest, a judicial scrutiny read by, led by the former head of MI6, Lord Justice Stuart Smith, in 1998 at the instigation of Jack Straw to see if there was any new evidence had emerged and a private prosecution of the two most senior police officers in the year 2000. A hung jury on David Duckenfield. The Hillsborough Project began in 1990 when I was at Hedgehill University. We were funded by the Liverpool City Council. We produced two substantial reports, one in 1990, one in 1995. We were building a different story. We were interviewing those who were the survivors and the bereaved of Hillsborough. We were also accessing a whole range of documents previously unseen. And then Jimmy McGovern, from that work, made his drama documentary. And finally, in 1999, I produced the first edition, this is the third, of Hillsborough, The Truth, telling the alternative story. 2009, the persistent myths and denials of Hillsborough have lived on another 10 years. Documents have been released in dribs and drabs. I've moved on, I'm here. I'm doing work on prisons, I'm doing work on, on children and young people. But Hillsborough is never very far away. And what we see during this period is the persistence of the myth that Liverpool fans had killed Liverpool fans. We see the persistence of denials that have become institutionalised. And we see the newspaper coverage, which is now sullying the reputation, not only of those who died, but of those who survived. People talked about families seeking closure. Closure is a word that comes easily to the tongue. Closure is a word that we invent to make us feel better about other people's loss. How can you ever close a situation where you've lost a child, a husband, a mother, a grandfather in such circumstances? There is no such thing as closure. And it was at that point that I wrote the new edition of Hills with the Truth. I re-interviewed the families concerning the myths, the denials, and this concept of closure. And my intuition was accurate. But what they told me was they never felt that they had ever had justice delivered. But as all with all of us, they couldn't identify what that justice mean, meant. Did it mean acknowledgement? Did it just mean truth provision? Did it mean further prosecutions. What did it mean? And many were angry, angry at their loss, angry at the loss of loved ones who died since, some taking their own lives. What they were primarily seeking, however, was truth and acknowledgement of that truth. 20th anniversary, I was there with my family, with the families as usual. When, for the very first time, the families invited an outsider to speak to the 
ceremony to the memorial service. 30,000 people turned up at Anfield for that 20th anniversary service. And Andy Burnham, then Minister of State for Culture and Sport, he made a commitment that there would be a revisitation of all the documents. I met him that evening and said, it's not for me to tell the government minister, Andy, but you haven't got the powers. You've got to wait another 10 years before we have access to official documents. But he was as good as, good as his word. And the Hillsborough Family Support Group was asked to submit a case for bringing forward that access rule. And the document they produced was truth recovery, acknowledgement and resolution. And clearly I was involved in the creation of that document. As Peter has alluded to, the Home Secretary agreed to the appointment of the Hillsborough Independent Panel to access, research and analyse all of those documents that were available in both the public and private settings and for those documents to go into an archive. Our terms of reference, first of all, the oversight of that published disclosure. Secondly, to consult with the families, ensuring that all of those who were most affected, their views were taken into account. That disclosure would be first to the Hillsborough families and that there would be recommendations made by the panel for a public archive so that all of you from your home computer can access the documents. But most significantly, a report that would explain how the disclosed information added to public understanding, not only of the disaster but of the aftermath, its investigation, its inquiry. And the research process, important that it was independent, it was important that it became part of a university structure, external to the Home Office. The scope of that, the context of the disaster, right the way back. The actual circumstances of the disaster, the immediate circumstances, the months beforehand and on the day, and the aftermath, the long-term aftermath, the process of inquiry and investigation. That we would take those documents and we would syst systematically analyze them, cross-reference them, share them. And the research team was appointed in order to review all of those documents. But I was determined that we should also examine the medical evidence relating to Hillsborough. And Bill Kirkup, who was the medical expert on our panel, was the person who actually took that research forward in association with our researchers. The technical process was to take the hard copy originals and eventually to digitize them. So now you can access them. If you read the report online, every single reference you hit the reference and the document appears. The methodology was documentary analysis. We weren't going to be interviewing anybody. It was about cross-referencing, filling gaps, triangulation. If we couldn't work something out, we would look for the clues from other areas and then see if we could triangulate in order to get closer to a true version of the facts. This is the report. It's 12 substantive chapters, it's 400 pages. I haven't got time to go through the full content. What it demonstrated was the depth of institutional failings. That between 1981 and 1988, the alterations to the stadium, the alterations to the terrace had not been recorded. There were inadequate inspections, incredibly on such a stadium, there was no safety certificate. Sheffield City Council hadn't awarded a safety certificate to Hillsborough for over a decade. And none of those changes had been taken into account. The building of the pens, the restrictions on access. And what we found was structural deficiencies at every level. The capacity was wrong. The fencing was the wrong height. The barriers weren't appropriate. Some of them were 40, 50 years old. They were rotten at the core. Access in and egress out were completely inhibited. 
There was no way you could evacuate those pens in an emergency. How did we find this out? By simply going to all of the documents throughout that 10-year period. When in 1981, at a previous semi-final, over 30 people had been injured in a crush in, those, in what became those central pens, but their lives had been saved because there weren't pens. They were able to disperse along the terrace. That was the clue. And what that gave us was the ability to be able to say that Hillsborough was foreseeable, which conceptually, legally, is an absolutely crucial issue. We found that the management of the stadium, Sheffield Wednesday Football Club, the Football Association, South Yorkshire Police, was deficient at every level, particularly the South Yorkshire Police operational order, that there was a systemic failure in emergency response, in leadership, in coordination, in communications, at every level. And what we also found was the real evidence of deflecting responsibility, not least the focus on alcohol, that the South Yorkshire Police interviews, as I had found out and published earlier, the interviews with the bereaved in the gymnasium after they had identified their loved ones in body bags in a gymnasium, the interviews that followed way into the night focused on whether or not their children, their loved ones, their fathers, their mothers, whether they had would have taken alcohol before the game, whether they had a criminal record. Was this an identification? Was it interrogation? And this was what had influenced the coroner's decision to record blood alcohol levels of men, women and children, the youngest 10 years old of those who died. The South Yorkshire Police went out and searched laybys on the pass from Merseyside over to Yorkshire to see if they could find cans and bottles. Not only did they record it, they filmed it. South Yorkshire police interviews immediately went to publicans in Sheffield to find information on whether or not Liverpool fans had been heavily drinking more usually than others. And one of the documents that we came across which was absolutely astounding was that everyone who died was checked to see if they had a criminal record. Everyone who had any alcohol in their blood. Their, their criminal record, if they had one, was checked. Nothing has surprised me over 24 years doing this work. That did. That was a shock. That is how it was recorded. The names of all who had even minimal, and most of them did have minimal, like half a pint, a pint of beer, had taken very little alcohol, their addresses, their ages, and whether or not they had a criminal record. I don't think that that was being done as a matter of public interest. The inquests, which I'd already critically appraised as being flawed, decision to hold preliminary hearings, unprecedented uh, presentation of evidence to the jury, which could not be contested because the preliminary hearings were not established as a full inquest, the South Yorkshire Police use of inquest to try, and they state this quite clearly, to reverse the Taylor findings, which had put the responsibility for the disaster at the door of the police the re-emphasis on drunkenness, on ticketlessness, and an important issue that all who died had received their injuries that killed them by 3.15. This was an important issue, that they died within four to six minutes because it meant that they were irrecoverable. And what that actually meant was that nobody from the ambulance service who'd gone into the pens or taken people to hospital was ever, ever came into the, to, to, to the inquest. That was a major deficiency. What did we find when we actually accessed the clinical histories of every single individual who died? That in inevitability of death was an unsustainable claim. That the pathologists were wrong in the evidence that they'd given from the actual investigations they'd conducted. That in actual fact, it was clear 
that over 40, well, 41 definitely were prolonged survival, and maybe as many as 58, another 17 beyond that, had been partially asphyxiated. And we had to deliver this to the families on the 12th of September, which was that had the response been more appropriate, quicker, swifter, their loved ones might have lived and we know the 41. The focus on al alcohol was unjustified, the evidence was flawed. In actual fact, when we looked at the evidence, what we discovered was that for a soccer game, and predominantly male, young male soccer game, it was remarkable how few had high blood alcohol levels, only three of the 96, and even then it was only just above the level that we would consider appropriate for driving. The alcohol investigations were completely unacceptable and we were able to say with absolute certainty that alcohol and drunkenness played no part. I, I first got this, uh, the, the, this piece of correspondence from Hammond Suddart, one of the biggest firms of solicitors in the north of England. I first came across this uh, in the late 1990s and it's to the head of management services in South Yorkshire Police. And basically, it is an appraisal of every single police officer's statement by the firm of solicitors. The relevance of it was that in the immediate aftermath, the police officers were told not to write up Police and Criminal Evidence Act statements, but to handwrite their statements, submit them to their seniors. This is an example of David Frost's. It was then typed and then it was edited by his senior colleagues. And what you see before you is that same page with the lines through his evidence. And there you see the same page with a signature at the bottom, David Frost's signature. I said to David Frost when I first met him on the snowy hills of Sheffield, and he gave me these statements. But at the end of it all, David, you signed your statement. I'll never forget that moment. It's my signature, but I didn't put it there. And I reveal that in Hills with the Truth, that the police statements had been reviewed and altered systematically, institutionally, by a team of six officers under Chief Superintendent Wayne, answering directly to the Chief Constable of South Yorkshire. The evidence had been systemically corrupted. It was initiated very clearly within the South Yorkshire Police prior to the West Midlands Police Investigation Team coming into the process. The purpose of the South Yorkshire Police written, re written recollections, transformation of those recollections into evidential statements, impact and influence of review and alteration completely coloured all aspects of the inquiry and investigation process. And when we came to do the research for the panel, we found that the South Yorkshire Ambulance Service uh, South Yorkshire Ambulance Service statements have gone through the same process. This isn't new evidence. This is the review of my book in the Sunday Mirror in 1999, How the Truth Was Censored. Who knew? The officers knew. A few days after, a certain chief superintendent took us out, told us, look, unless we get our heads together and straighten it out, heads are going to roll. I remember one night sitting bolt upright in bed, fast asleep, and saying to my partner, they all knew, and so they did. The West Midlands Police Investigation Team, Lord Justice Taylor, the Coroner, the Treasurer, Solicitor of the Home Office, they all knew that this was the process that had gone through. And the final area I want to touch on is an area that I know many people in here will know something about. 
Kelvin McKenzie's decision as editor of The Sun a few days after the disaster to tell the truth of Hillsborough. Some fans picked pockets, some fans urinated on the brave cops, some fans beat up PCs given the kiss of life. This was part of the orchestration. From the outset and everything I've written, I've said, to go so bold with such deceit, you have to be confident you can stand over what you have. Just weeks before we were due to publish our report, and we delayed it by six months, I finally got access to the material that filled the gap and gave me the evidence of why he was so bold and could be so bold. The police had gone to a news agency. They gave these statements that Fans had kicked and punched as they gave the kiss of life, openly urinating on us, the bodies of the dead. Had fans entered the ground in an orderly, civilized manner, crushing would never have happened, picking the pockets of victims. And in case you think we don't have the evidence, this is it. And the politician, Irving Patnick, went also to White's news agency. They filed stories from those unsolicited allegations made by high-ranking South Yorkshire police officers. And Mr. Patnick was interviewed too. He was their triangulation. And again, this is the facts that demonstrates the relationship between the news agency and the politician. So it's incredible that the son writes to the families, Trevor Hicks, and Jenny Hicks were burying their two daughters on the day they received this letter. Including the bereaved family, all of the bereaved families, he writes to say he will not apologize for its substance because it was factually accurate and the son had a duty to tell true, the truth to the nation. It was in this letter. And the police federation meeting on that very same day, were given a free hand. By who? Putting our side of the story over to the press and media, they say had been his a priority. The chief constable stated that the truth could not come from him, but he gave the police federation a free hand. This is the minute of the meeting of the police federation in a restaurant on that day that the Sun headline came out when who turns up but the chief constable? We have to create a defense. We have to create a rock solid story. The force would be exonerated by the Taylor inquiry predicted and blame should be directed towards drunken ticketless individuals. And in support of that, we see the South Yorkshire police sworn statements alleging drunken behavior and violent behavior being supplied to Irving Patnick and the agency then forwarding his statements. And in response to Taylor, another meeting that is held by the Police Federation, meeting with Michael Shursby, parliamentary representative, where in this they're developing a counter-attack, not my words, to repudiate Lord Justice Taylor's findings. And so, on the 12th of September 2012, we were able to say with absolute certainty when the families received this report, families first, no one else had seen this report prior, not even the Prime Minister. We were able to deliver that report and we were able to say that the fans were not the cause of the disaster. And our hope was that greater transparency will bring to the families and to the wider public greater understanding. Because we felt that it was only with that transparency that those who behaved with such dignity through those years can with some sense of truth, we said, and justice cherish the memory of their loved ones. So. Finally, what is the impact, which is what today is about? The Prime Minister apologized immediately, hours after, or minutes after that report was 
was, was given to the families and the two hours that I spent delivering it in Liverpool Cathedral to them for the double injustice. The Independent Police Complaints Commission has now set up the biggest investigation into 2,000 officers into police misconduct, a criminal investigation where individuals and corporate bodies are now being fully investigated in terms of their role at Hillsborough. The Attorney General in the High Court, the Attorney General submitted to the High Court a request for the quashing of inquests. Those verdict, verdicts have now been quashed. New inquests have been ordered. The Chief Medical Officer has told the Royal College of Pathologists that they must review their procedures in issues of, of mass death. And the, and the Chief Executive of the NHS has written to all emergency services and health authorities to change their ways of dealing and responding to issues such as these. Critical, ro re critical re social research is about bearing witness. It's about chronicling events. It's about, as I suppose one of my hidden mentors, although I never met him, C. Wright Mills, called turning personal troubles into public issues, making relevant the personal troubles we face. And turning cases into issues is the phrase that Stephen Anden from the Institute of Race Relations has always used in terms of making public that which we do, building alternative accounts, seeking the truth, securing acknowledgement. And what is important in all of this is how we hold states to account. Two days ago, I had the daunting task of speaking to some 15,000 people at Anfield. I didn't want this to be about me or our research. I wanted it to be about them. How could I turn 200,000 words into a statement? So for those of you who are English scholars, I apologize. The poem I wrote and read is called The Voices Will Be Heard. With early spring's sun came warmth and hope, spirits lifted through snow-capped hills, streets alive with nervous laughter, another adventure in another place. Vibrant voices breaking solitude's silence. Approaching Hillsborough calm and joyous, walking expectantly to a Wembley final. Safe passage ended down that fateful tunnel, in pens like cattle between concrete and steel. Desperate voices, so cruelly silenced. From callous indifference in a gymnasium's cold to taking blood from the innocent, the young, their deaths examined through a distorted lens, rupturing further families' broken hearts. Bereaved voices, cowed by contempt. Lies tripped easily from forked tongues, condemning, vilifying the rescuers, the brave, relentlessly feeding pens, filled with poison, rewriting the truth, spreading deceit, survival's voices denied, dismissed. The verdicts and judgments that came and went, lawyers and politicians minced their words. A city portrayed as racked by self-pity, its people's isolation now complete. Determined voices now walking alone, Shattered by loss, but unbroken in spirit, in the face of injustice, you never backed down. You forced them to listen, you sacrificed your lives. You bore witness with dignity on the day of reckoning. And their voices have been heard. That is the true impact of the Hillsborough research which was conducted in this university. And I'm grateful to my colleagues in this university and the leadership in this university that has enabled that to happen. It makes a difference. It's their story. It's not mine. Thank you for listening.